Todd Elliott, welcome to the Church Front Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be back. Yeah, Todd, you were on maybe uh, early March of 2020? 20, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Seems longer ago than that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, man, it was back in the day, pre, almost pre-pandemic. It was right at the beginning because we were talking about the Philo Conference, all the things that were going to be changing at that point. Lots right. to talk about and catch up with you on here in this episode, but why don't you start us off for those who are unfamiliar with you, why don't you catch us up on who you are, what you do, and then what you're up to these days. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, so my name is Todd Elliott. I am the founder of Philo, uh, First In, Last Out, which uh, we do a conference, we have a podcast. Um, very long story about how we got there, but uh, in my history, uh, I've spent a lot of time just uh, wishing that uh there was a community of tech people that could gather together and kind of commiserate and laugh at the same jokes and uh, just ask questions of each other, learn from best practices. And so I've been in that um, world for, uh, it's probably been 20 years when I first decided, like, if I wish this were happening, I should do something about it. And so starting something, joining other things, just, yeah, trying to be about, yeah, encouraging the local technical artist. Um where our little tagline in Philo world is we want to make tech people more effective so that their churches are more effective. Um, we're all doing this for a higher purpose, not just for production sake. Uh, the reason we're doing it is so that the church can accomplish its mission. And so that's kind of our goal is to make that happen, um, by encouraging tech people, um, and, uh, yeah, helping them get better at skills and, uh, yeah, be a part of a community. So, uh, like I said, I've been doing that on and off for 20 years. I've worked at a couple, a uh, couple churches uh, in that time. Uh, one in Michigan, uh, where I sort of learned everything. I started as an audio engineer and just kind of ticked my way through all the disciplines uh, until then. I was leading a group of uh, people doing all that, and then moved to Willow Creek back in 2004. I started so quite a while ago, and. Um, yeah, I was there for about 10 years and doing various things, but uh, leading the team there, uh, the production team. And now I'm uh, doing Philo full-time uh, for the last six years. I just sort of crossed the six-year mark. Um, and if I think about it, six years ago today, I had no idea. I think we'd finally figured out what we were going to call the thing. Um, <laughs> and then just like, all right, let's try it, see what happens. And if it bombs, we'll stop doing it. But yeah, you know, here we are six years later. Um, in this year of pandemic, it's been a little tougher than most. But yeah, we're still... still uh, yeah, clipping away and have plans for 2020. Uh, tw I'm sorry, 2021. And it's coming up. We don't, uh, we still, you know, it's hard to make a decision uh, about, you know, people gathering together. So we're just trying to hold it loosely and plan like crazy at the same time. And uh, right now, plan A is we're meeting May 11th and 12th in Chicago for a live event. Um, and plan B is uh, on 11th and 12th, we'll, we'll do a virtual event instead if we have to. But um, anyway, that's kind of what I'm up to now. I also, um, I uh, do a lot of freelance work and I own a production company. So I'm doing, uh, you know, just outside events. Uh, most of those are virtual these days. Um, yeah, so that's sort of my, my life is divided into thirds, a third Philo, a third freelance and a third uh, clients and, you know, live production management. Yeah. So yeah, keeps me busy for sure. I love it. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's good to be in the environment that you're in and still, you know, being a Philo kind of the, the CEO or the, or the founder of Philo and you're still in the environment serving right. you know, and putting on events. And even if it is virtual, it's still using the technical arts, I guess, to, to make those events happen. So totally. And I, for me, it was really important. I mean, it's real easy. Like this week, uh, earlier this week, I was shooting videos where I was the person uh, you know, in front of the camera and reading from a teleprompter. And like I, uh, my life as a Philo person is so, it uh, turns out to be very different from what my life was like as a person doing production. Um, and so I, 
I, I like staying involved and understanding what's happening and remembering, oh, this is what it feels like to be ignored <laughs> or to feel invisible or to be the last one here. I mean, it just, I think it's real easy to forget uh, those feelings. And so, yeah, to be still involved in it is uh, real important to me. So, yeah. And you, you guys, I mean, you guys did your Philo conference when we chatted in March. It was just about to happen. Um, and you were kind right. of at that point where you had just called the shot that it was going to be a virtual <laughs> conference. How did that go? And did you learn anything from that experience? Because that was early in the pandemic. Yeah, we were like, like, like one of the very first to, to kind of pull the trigger on something like that. Um, yeah. How did it go? I, um, I think it, it went really well. I mean, it was so bizarre and different. So it was really hard to gauge it relative to past Philo conferences. But I feel like um, the thing that was really beautiful about it, uh, frankly, was that we had about six to 700 people that came that were not from the United States. Yep. Um, so f- all over the world, I mean, there was a group in India that stayed awake all night to, to participate in Philo. And so they're wow. part of the chat rooms and, um, we really, you know, the, even after it was all over, we were talking to, um, the company that handled kind of all the, the website and, you know, the analytics and all that stuff. And they were like, we've never seen numbers this high, like, you know, people staying engaged, you know, for long periods of time. And, um, that was really surprising. Uh, I mean, and not knowing what to expect was another part of it. We had 2,300 tickets sold, which, you know, I think the year before we had 1600 people at the conference itself. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so turnout was great. The content was amazing. Um, yeah, I think, uh, it, it was a huge success, and I, uh, when it was happening, I said, you know, I feel like we're doing a. Gr- this is going really well, and I never want to do this again. <laughs> um, you know, uh, because it doesn't compare to being in person. Um, yeah. And yeah. we took a we took a survey of the attendees, you know, afterwards, and I would say almost every answer was, "I loved it. It was great, but it's not the same as being together." Yeah. So um, there's something what do the people about people overseas say about it, though, because that for them that removed the travel expense to get there, so it made it a little bit more accessible too. Yeah, totally. And I think to people who had never attended, so you know, most of those international people, I think for them they were they they were so hungry for the content that like this is the greatest thing ever. And when yeah. are you coming to? India or when are you coming to uh, the UK or, you know, we had a lot of those conversations. Um, And so, yeah, really uh, exciting to, again, our goal is to help make the local church more effective. And so to, uh, to know that there are churches that are better in Vietnam because their tech person attended Philo. I mean, that just, that blows my mind. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. So I, on one hand, you know, if we go virtual uh, May 11th and 12th, uh, there's something really great about that that, you know, doesn't happen. While we don't get the community sense from being together, we're gaining some global thing that we don't get, um, yep. you know, from the live event. So 100 percent. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's encouraging. Any any. Um technical things that you learned as you as your team put this on or I guess you guys did outsource kind of the overall production of it but I'm assuming your team was heavily involved in kind of the execution you know moment to moment anything that you guys learned pretty quickly as one of the the forerunners to a virtual conference (laughs) well I mean I think the the thing that is interesting about Philo uh, and how we kind of operate our um the breakout sessions is that I'm interested in uh, those classes being taught by people who are actually doing the thing they're teaching about. So not a manufacturer, not a salesperson, but somebody who like, Hey, this is what I do every weekend. And this is what it looks like. And you know, somebody that our audience can totally relate to Well, finding a tech person who's crushing it in their area of expertise and likes to, stand up in front of a group of people and present, you know, that those generally don't go together. So we, we're usually, it's hard to find the right, uh, you know, the right person, uh, to teach those classes. So then this year we say, Hey, by the way, 
uh, we need you to like videotape yourself doing it. <laughs> <laughs> put, um, a, put a ring light on yourself yeah you know, right wear the black shirt but you're not in the shadows anymore <laughs> right right and so yeah it was i mean this was in march when we were deciding this and you know trying to get all of our all the people who had said yes to teaching a breakout okay now will you just do it um you know um yeah, uh, film yourself doing it. And so some people said, yeah, I don't feel comfortable doing that. And so then we're scrambling to figure out how to do that. So I facilitated a lot more breakouts than normal, just doing uh, uh, Skype calls and, you know, switching. So I would be kind of the host, but using a stream deck, switching between camera shots and PowerPoint and all this stuff and recording it. Uh, so that was a fun little learning curve. But like we had some people... Uh, you know, their environment looked horrible. Their their webcam was awful. We had some, uh, one person shot their breakout in their car. Um, oh, no. <laughs> which actually was the highest rated breakout uh, really? from our survey. Yeah, just the content was amazing. So I guess it doesn't matter that you're, they weren't driving, uh, but they were just oh, probably the hilarious. only quiet place they could find. Like just an and that, iPhone or something just yeah, recorded? Yeah, totally, it, yep. iPhone, yeah. <laughs> And then another person, uh, yeah, it was on a boat. Um, <laughs> one guy was in a cabin that barely had electricity. Yeah, it was it was the, kind of the whole gamut. But I think, um, yeah, for me, I feel like if the content is good, yeah, and the and the delivery is adequate, then mm-hmm. yeah, give me the content all day long, and I'll deal yeah. with the with the inadequacies of the delivery. But. Yep. We can um, always put a headphone in and walk away and not right. have to look at the yeah. screen, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and then I guess uh, on the other side, we had a lot of people that, you know, had used their big setup with a TV in the shot and well lit and, you know, just very produced. And yeah, so those those people nailed that. Um, but yeah, it, did I, did we learn anything? I I mean, we must, we totally did, uh, but what specifics I'm maybe drawing a blank on right now. Uh-huh. I mean, I think the, the biggest thing is give yourself more than six weeks to plan an event uh, of that size. <laughs> Especially virtual, right? It's just, yeah. it, there's always something, there's always something right. that happens. That's that's for in-person too, but virtual especially, it's like, man, well, who knows if my power is going to go out today or if the internet's right, right. going to be, you know, tethered down a little bit and it's always yeah. something. I mean, I would say for me, I've been talking to as many people as I can who have been doing uh, virtual events. What did you learn? How did you do it? Mm-hmm. What would you change? Just a, a, as a way to try to learn uh, a different way of doing it. Um, ours was entirely simulated live, so we pre-recorded yeah. everything, assembled it in the edit suite. I mean, even when we were doing it, it was full on lockdown. Like you couldn't leave your house. I mean, they're saying don't leave your house. Yeah. So all the band members recorded from home wow. and then we assembled it together. Um, all the speakers, the hosts, every, everybody had to stay home. And so there was no real way to do it live. Um, and so we did it that way. So I think, um, yeah, I, I would, I would maybe make a few changes there, but, um, yeah, I like I said, I hope to never do it again, but definitely it's it's always kind of running around in the back of my mind. Yep. How are we going to do this better, differently? Yeah. I love that. And yeah. catch me up. I mean, I know um, you're, you're no longer serving in a staff con- context at Willow, but um, I'm sure people who are familiar with Willow, Willow's a, a pretty large church. I mean, they're their venue is big. They've got multi-site happening. I mean, how has your experience there or how has that church kind of handled this season? They're in Chicago. So in, in Illinois, um, and their kind of restriction mantra right now, but sure. what's, what's their approach been to the live streaming, the, the simulated live streaming situation, Ben? Yeah. So, um, yeah, with all the different campuses, it's been interesting to see how each campus handles things. Um, up until recently, um, the structure of uh, Willow Creek and their all their sites was a little bit of figure it out yourself and do your own thing with mm-hmm. some boundaries. Um, and uh, it's it's really interesting because at Willow Creek during this pandemic, they had a leadership change, so they've been searching for a new senior pastor. Right. So that that uh, has also been a huge factor, just you know, like a totally different leadership model. Yeah. 
all good and whatever, but just different. And um, and so the, it's been interesting. The the uh, the main campus at Willow, the uh, the South Barrington campus, the big one, um, their risk uh, is much greater, uh, or their risk assessment, you know, of their situation, like. We can have more people, we're more exposure, um, and so we're just going to shut everything down and just lock it down and nobody come to work and we're mm. totally streaming, you know, uh, like kind of like we did with uh, with Philo, like band members at home and assembling it all together. And um, and so that's been, um, that's been lifted a little bit. So now they're doing a lot more. They'll uh, film in front of a small audience. Um, on a particular day, the the worship and the message, and then replay that on the weekends. Um, the campus that I go to, we've been meeting actually in person on the weekends. Um, you know, about twenty percent capacity uh, yep. to the auditorium, so that ends up being about two to two hundred and fifty people. Um, and uh, the worship is live, and uh, yep. we're all wearing masks, and um, the. Uh, the Philo offices, we rent space actually from another uh, Willow campus, and uh, I don't think they're meeting in person, so they're doing a, they're streaming live on the weekend. So they'll yeah. um, they as opposed to pre recording anything, they just set it up and do it. And um, uh, the message comes from a central uh, you know central teacher, and so that is a playback thing. But all the worship and announcements and all that, the live stream for this campus is totally live. Um, yeah, so it's like however many campuses there are, that's how many different ways they're doing it uh, at the moment. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it sounds very similar. I mean, where where we're at in Austin, our church is kind of similar. Each each location can kind of do it within boundaries, right? Do make their yeah. own decisions. And so that's, I feel like that's pretty effective and it's good to hear that you guys have, have, uh, been able to meet a little bit and been able to, you know, capacity is like, okay, we can deal with capacity. The, the fact that we're able to meet and gather and worship and this is, it brings a whole new joy when you get to yeah. experience personal worship again. It's interesting too, because I think, um, I would have imagined that the campus I attend, that people would be like lining up outside the door to get those 200 spots. And it really hasn't been that way, which mm-hmm. has been a little bit surprising. Um, so I think people are still uh, leery of of um, going out and going yeah. to church. I, I would have to say for me, I was at a hardware store the other day. Uh, and I'm just like, this feels more dangerous than church, in my yeah. opinion. I'm like jammed in these little teeny aisles, uh, people not... Uh, social distancing in the right way or whatever but at church it feels like yeah it's a big place yep lots of room uh, i can kind of <laughs> avoid people if i need to i was laughing with my wife the other day i have a kind of a small personal bubble anyway you know just like yeah. i don't like being near too many people so this whole COVID, shopping during COVID is like sent me over the edge. I was just like, I definitely have a very small bubble. Get yep. away from me, people. Yep. <laughs> we even at our campus, we we used to have one long, um, you know, rack unit that was a mobile kind of on wheels uh, that held our computers and our displays and things for the production booth. We would just okay. wheel it out week to week and would sit in the middle of the the gymnasium or auditorium that we meet in and. Uh, we've since COVID, we've separated into three separate units. So the, the <laughs> audio is one desk, the the video and the stream is one desk, and then the pro presenter and the lights are one desk. And so we're all very separated. And so we're able yeah. to like really socially distant with each other. It's pretty, I mean, I don't mind it. You know, it's pretty yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Get your own little booth there and nobody's right, right. infiltrating your bubble. It's pretty nice. <laughs> infiltrating. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, man, I'd love to jump in. I mean, one of the primary reasons we're, we're chatting now is because in the midst of a pandemic, you have um, bravely, but I think wisely released a book. You guys have yes. published a book. So um, for those of you who don't know, Todd has, has authored a book called I Love Jesus, But I Hate Christmas, one of the greatest titles to any book we could have <laughs> ever imagined. Uh, the design on the book is great. We love, we've had so many people say, oh my gosh, I read the title was so confused. And then I looked at the book and its design and realized it's a, it's a book for technical artists. Like it's a book for people (laughs) in ministry in the church. And so I love uh, that people are, are seeing that and resonating that. Would you kind of just tell people 
why a book? Why did you put out a book? And then I have lots of questions and things I want to pick your brain about as I have dug through it and have my own notes and things like that. Yeah, I guess maybe one quick comment on the cover. So we, when we were designing the cover, it, the graphic designer, it was all audio knobs and, and faders and stuff. And I said, we need to like, we need to integrate some like video controls and some lighting yes. control just so everybody feels like they're included. So um, <laughs> I was like sending her photos, like this part of the CCU on a camera and yes. this part of the lighting console. Anyway, that was fun Love to do. Yeah. The uh, why write a book? So there are many uh, things, many answers to that question for me. Uh, most recently, the the f- doing the Philo conference uh, at Willow Creek, most specifically, they have they had a bookstore, and the the person running the bookstore would always say, "Hey, do you have any resources you'd like us to offer your people? Uh, you know, just to have for sale or whatever." And I would say, "Yes, but none exist." Um, so. Never mind. Um, and so, th- yeah, the, it was just it, a lot of it was born out of frustration. Like, there's this thing that that doesn't exist. So let's let's do it. You know, uh, let's do it. And I think very similar to like even starting gatherings for tech people. I just had this sense that this is a thing that's bugging me. And if I if it's bugging me, I I need to be the one to do something about it. Like I just can't complain. And so, honestly, the to again most recently to have that kind of frustration, I was probably eighty percent done with. I mean, I had eighty percent of this thing written, yeah, and just said, "Okay, it's time for the last twenty percent. We got to push it across the finish line." Um, and so, it's been something that I've been working on for uh, well since two thousand six mm-hmm. uh, or thereabouts, so a long time. And for me, it was really. Um, it started as a meaningless exercise to stay awake in a meeting um, that I had every week that was super boring. And so I'm like, okay, if I wrote a book, what would the chapters be about? You know, just like something to keep my mind occupied. Well, then it turned into, you know, 10 pages, 20 pages. Like I just kept adding to it um, yeah. and got to a place where I felt like, um, yeah, not to be over spiritual, but felt like God was saying, you need to finish this and you just need to trust me that it, uh, with the outcomes, like Mm -hmm. whether it sells a million copies or zero, that part doesn't matter, but it's about like doing the work. And so, um, yeah, so it took me 15 years to, I guess, obey God's commands in my life. But, um, I did, I have to say, started blogging just because I thought that would kind of help, uh, alleviate uh, my obligation to actually write a book, but anyway, glad it's done. Uh, I love that it's out. Uh, actually, we're doing um, a thing we're calling the Philo Cohort, so it's just like a small cool. group that I'm leading, and we're going not going line by line through this, but definitely this is the roadmap for our content, and so that's been really great to have something just to say, oh, we'll talk about this now, or you yeah. know, here's our topics for next week. So. And we were chatting before we press record, but there are going to be so many people who are, who have been like the the ten hour a week or the high key volunteers in their churches that have been running production for a while that probably yeah. have moved into some sort of a part time or full time staff member at a church to make production and live streaming happen. So I'm so glad that you guys are providing a, a community for people like that to hop in and say, hey, I've. I'm new to this. Help me. And Todd, with your years of, of being in the field and in that experience level, you can share just through the book and through your own conversations with these folks, encouragement and, you know, ways to think about things, which I think will be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great so far. And our first cohort that we're doing, we have people a part of a 500 person church and some people part of a 30,000 person church. And it's amazing from a couple different countries and it's amazing how similar we all are. Doesn't you know the size isn't the issue. We all have uh, you know uh, volunteers that are hard to work with, and 
uh, challenges with the bass player or, you know, just like the things that come up when you're a tech person in the local church. So yeah, yeah it's been really good. I love it. Well, in light of that, as you talk about, you know, those people who are part of these cohorts and even just experiencing that transition right now, one of my first questions that I had as I was reading the book, um, you, one of the first things that you address kind of right out the gate might've been on in the first two or three chapters pretty quick. You talked about reaching a point where you had become passive aggressive as a, as a tech director or as a kind of production engineer in, in your field. Can you talk to me about what that looked like and how you got to that place? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, passive aggressivity is like my middle name. Uh, it's kind of how I am wired up uh, naturally, maybe uh, just to <laughs> kind of uh, say, okay, whatever, you know, just do it. And, um, and yeah, I don't know when I, I mean, I could think of a couple key moments where I was passive aggressive and it just did not go well. And I was fortunate enough to have a couple people in my life uh, that were, uh, one was my boss, one was my senior pastor, that just did not let me get away with it um, and would really call me out when it would happen. Mm. Um, And I would say, I mean, now, I mean, this is like probably a thought I've had before, but it's just coming to me kind of in a fresh way. So much of what the book the things I learned in, you know, that I share in the book, I learned because of those people who are willing to say unacceptable, um, like, let's talk about this. And, um, yeah, I think the, when I saw the difference that, uh, you know, from being passive aggressive to like, let's talk this out and I still might not get my way, but at least we're understanding each other a little better. Yeah my life totally changed. And I realized that so much of how I approached my ta- the task of doing production for my church, I took all the responsibility myself, um, even for things that were not mine to, to, to hold on to. So here's a great example that maybe we all can understand. Like you have a worship leader or a music director who shows up on Sunday morning with, oh, I... I have an extra guitar and I invited another keyboard player. Um, And I used to get so angry. This is like classic Todd Elliott early days, just so passive aggressive. Um, But I had, I had uh, like a practical problem. I had a, I had a personal problem with it, but I also, the practical problem was I didn't, I only had 24 channels on the soundboard. And so I don't, maybe I don't have room for these things. And uh, I started realizing that, um, you know, I would compromise the mix to accommodate these things. And at a certain point, I real and we'd start rehearsal late because I wasn't prepared for right. those things. And somewhere along the way, I realized, like, wait a second, this isn't my fault that we're starting rehearsal late or that the mix sucks. This is the music director's. I mean, the, he needs to own some of this with me. Yeah. And so uh, I realized that you know, to have a simple conversation when that would happen. Hey, I've got these extra pieces of gear, uh, you know, extra instruments to plug in for me to say, great. I love it. You know, glad, glad more people are involved. Here's my problem. Uh, we're going to start rehearsal five minutes late to get these things plugged in. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I need to unplug something. So let's look at the input list. What do you want me to unplug? Um, okay. Yeah, so unplug those things, and here we go. Yep. And it totally changed how I felt about it, how he felt about me. Um, it turned me into a team player instead of just that grumpy tech guy. Um, and it ter- it took a, a way um, how I was feeling about him as like that guy who always shows up with a last minute thing. Like yeah. he can own this with me. And you know what? He started like uh, figuring that stuff out ahead of time. Um, and all it was was me sharing the responsibility. Start rehearsal late, good, okay, and then to, you you point to the thing you want me to get rid of in the yeah. mix. So, um, <laughs> and I think for a music person, you know, they spent all this time trying to get it just right. Um, they want it to sound good, and so unplugging things doesn't feel great. And so to realize that we only have so much space, so what are we going to use that space for? Yeah. And let's figure it out Thursday instead of Sunday morning. 
And I'm sure that was a pretty, I mean, I, I'm assuming in some environments is not a quick lesson, but I'm sure that when you verbalize those things, it actually helps move the ball forward and progressing towards not having those issues anymore. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah, so we stopped having some of those issues and I, I was like, I felt this burden lifted, you know, I'm like, mm-hmm. this is not my problem to solve alone. This is our problem to solve together. And yeah, just, it totally changed my outlook. Um, instead of dreading, is he going to come with something else uh, this week? It was just like, ah, well, f- we'll figure it out if it yeah. does. And I'll start worrying about something else now. So, yeah, it's almost like uh, I almost think of it as like the it's almost like parenting in the sense that you every, almost everything can be related to parenting, I feel like. But <laughs> yeah, right, when you discipline, true. you're explaining why you discipline and, and what the reason for the discipline is. And totally. so rather than become passive aggressive and deal with the things, but holding the the comments or the, the reasonings back, you're actually putting words in a professional manner to them. And then right. speaking them into existence so that everybody is aware, oh, there are consequences for wanting to add something last minute. And we do have to deal with this repercussion if we're going to make these decisions last minute. Yeah. And I think, I, you know what, for me, it was some of that for sure, like, you know, uh, verbalizing kind of what was going on. But the the motivation for that for me came from the fact that I realized that uh, I made assumptions that everybody thought like I did. Hmm. You have an idea, you you can extrapolate out what the consequences are, and then you're asking me anyway to do yeah. those things. <laughs> and at a certain point, I realized, like my my arts director, the the music person, they don't think like I do, and so they don't have those thoughts. And so, how yeah. could they know what the ramifications were? And so, of course, they're asking because they don't know what they're asking for. Even that changed changed the ball game for me. Like, the church needs me to step into that moment because I'm the one thinking that way. And if we want this to work, we need my ideas to solve this problem. Yeah. Um, instead of like, why can't these people plan better? And you know, well, they're designed to come up with the ideas, not to plan them. Yeah, that's what I'm there for. So that even that was such a and uh, to get in the book, the very first section is kind of about my realization that, hey, we're all different, and but mm-hmm. we, we all need each other if we're going to make this work. And so figuring out who are you, how do you fit into the puzzle, and then own that space uh, as much as you can. Yeah, because you, and one of the things you said in that first section was you said that God started to change the way you viewed yourself and your role. My question yeah. for, for you as I was reading that, that was like, oh, I need to ask Todd this question. <laughs> yeah. How did that happen? Like when you say that God started to change the way you view yourself, a lot of people, they either read a book or they go to a conference, or they listen to a podcast and something like the light bulb goes off. Yeah. What was it for you in that season that, that transitioned your mindset to start viewing your role differently? Yeah, I uh, it was basically it came out of a big argument I had with uh, one of the guys that worked f- uh, with me. Um, so I, uh, as as the church grew and our the task grew, I started um, had to hire people to kind of fill some roles, and so um, it was actually the very first person I hired. Uh, we got into an argument over what was the point of what we were doing. And mm. so I was trying to come up with a mission statement that would describe for ourselves and for our volunteers what we're about. And it was essentially like, we're here to serve others. Like if I could boil it all down to, yeah. like, you know. And he would got so mad. Uh, he's like, oh, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to like make art with other people. Like we're here mm. to do this. We're doing, we're in ministry together. We're not just supporting ministry that's happening. What we're doing is ministry. Um, and so that's really where it started to change for me. Like what, okay, am I just here to serve? So you tell me what you want and I'll do it. Or are we here to like work together to create something together for the benefit of our congregation? And that, that's really that, the shift for me from purely techni- technician, uh, tell me what you want and I'll do it, to, all right, what are we doing? How can we do this best? What's What piece of me am I bringing to this uh, equation? Um, 
and what I yeah what I do is an art form unto itself and it maybe looks nothing like you know standing on stage and singing a song but it's you know problem solving or troubleshooting or um, yeah just uh, thinking creatively about how can we use the gear we have to accomplish that idea um, and so uh, yeah that it was just basically that big argument that I it's interesting I've talked to everybody who was in that room uh, when we started having that fight and I'm the only one who remembers it so <laughs> <laughs> it must not have been as bad as I thought it was <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I think that's hilarious that you're the only one who, that's why you wrote a book because yeah, you're, right. <laughs> it's been swimming in your mind for, right. for these years. Or maybe uh, it never actually happened. I guess there's <laughs> another, yeah, <laughs> I had a dream about it and it just seems real. <laughs> well, as you, as you talk about that, that brings up another area that I'd love to pick your brain about in those conversations when, well, let me back up a little bit. One of the primary questions I get from people you know, coaching people, doing kind of, you know, calls with, with people who are in ministry, they're always wondering, how do I get my team on board? How do I get my volunteers on board, you know, et cetera. And they're wondering, how do I get this unity on my team? And one of my encouragements is, well, you know, do you have a mission statement? Do you have a vision statement that you can use to rally your yeah. people around in agreement that like when all, when, when you're wrapping cables, this is why you're doing what you're doing. It's one of the biggest pieces that you talk about in the book in, in the last section is the why. And yeah. my question is for you, when you were doing that, when you were discerning, especially at Willow, um, with this kind of big, I, I would call it a large infrastructure. You were working with a lot of resources, right. with a lot of moving pieces. Um, you were doing iMag and multi-site and, you know, lots of design and audio, you know, integration. How, how did you even approach distilling it all down into a mission statement for your team? What was kind of the first step that you might have taken or you would encourage somebody to take if they're trying to do the same thing for their church? Yeah, so I think I learned the lesson years and years ago with this fight that I had about the first mission statement I ever wrote, um, which is it's important. Um, I think a lot of us, if you if you're a, if you're a technical artist and you're uh, let's say you're not leading people, you're just doing you're doing the task. You have certain things that you do for reasons, and most of us, I would argue, don't aren't in touch with those reasons. We're just doing the thing. Yep. And it's very important that if you now are starting to lead people, that you solidify those things, why you're doing those things, uh, to sit down and figure out why is this important to me? Or, um, And I think for me, it, it came from just many conversations with different people like, oh, if we don't agree on this. Why is that? And what are you thinking is important? And what am I thinking is important? And what is what should be important? Um, and so for me, writing down the mission statement, figuring out what the values are is so critical because yeah. it leads it's like a trickle down effect. Um, now, part of it is if you're the one coming up with a mission statement, generally speaking, nobody knows it better than you do. So you're in some ways, you're kind of sick of it uh, by the time you're ready to share with the team. But the reality is you have to keep talking about it. You have yep. to post it where people can see it. You have to, if you have, you know, if you figured out what your values are, like uh, we're ready for rehearsal five minutes before the band arrives or, you know, whatever the, whatever your things are that you're talking about them all the time. Um, one of the, uh, one of my favorite uh speakers recently has been Horst Schultz, yeah. who is uh, was Phenomenal. the yeah, CEO of Ritz-Carlton Hotel for, uh, for a time, and he developed these values that they talk about before every shift. So every Ritz-Carlton talks about the same value before every shift every day. And so with it, in a month's time, they will hit all or thereabouts are like 25 of them. And so they're always talking about them and they're not talking about them for, you know, 15 minutes. They're not doing a Bible study about it. They're not, um, you know, they're just talking about, Hey, remember this thing matters to us. And I have an, I have a story about it or whatever. Um, that it's so, it's such a useful idea that we should be doing the same thing, especially when you think about, we have volunteers that serve once a month, mm -hmm. every other week. Like if, you know, if you think about you share a value once a month, 
you have one quarter of your team is hearing it. Yeah. And so if you're wanting to kind of create a culture where we understand that um, what it means to make a mistake or what excellence looks like or, you know, whatever the things are, you have to be talking about it nonstop. And so I would say as a leader, maybe I have two thoughts. As a production person, I want somebody else to stand up front and say the things. Mm -hmm. That's not who I am. But the reality is there's nobody around that will stand up and understand these things like I do if I'm the leader. So suck it up and stand up there and talk about it. You know, you have to or else it won't happen. So um, I forget what the second thing I was going to say, but uh, yeah, I just... You have to talk about it. You have somebody has to stand up front and talk yep. about it. So yeah, nobody's making you be uh, um, an influencer, right? Nobody's forcing you to to open up your own Instagram profile or to buy a website <laughs> or to write a book or to start your own podcast. But if you want your team to have unity, if you want your team to rally around the same mission, vision, and values you got to communicate those pieces. Otherwise you have nobody to blame but yourself when it yeah. comes to like, why aren't they showing up on time or why aren't they being creative? Well, have they ever been told like, have they ever, right. And some people, I feel like they wonder why it doesn't stick. You know, they wonder, Oh, I said this thing one time to this person who serves once a month, they should be bought in and get it. It's like, no, yeah. it's probably going to take six, seven more times before they actually start to regurgitate what you've given them. Yeah. I mean, I think that, so if you have vision and values that you've written down, the th- there's a couple things. I would get your key influencers on board, like sit down, have coffee with them or get a Zoom call going and say, hey, I'm thinking about these things. This is what I'm imagining. What do you think? And if you can get four or five of your people on board that are bought in already, yep. now they can help kind of spread that uh, to the rest of the team. The other thing that's so important about it is that when somebody starts serving on your team, to sit down and say, here are the things that matter to us. Yep. So that when somebody violate that person violates one of these, you can go back to and say, hey, remember we talked about this? If you don't have that written down or you haven't had that conversation, it's hard to sit down with someone and say, you screwed up because... I never told you it was important, right. <laughs> you know? Um, and so it just makes those hard conversations so much, well, I mean, they're always difficult, but uh, they make them doable to say, hey, we have here, we show up five minutes early. You've been showing up five minutes late every week. So what's going on? And, um, you know, you need to, you know, meet this value or we yeah. need to have another hard conversation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, having stuff written down and figured out, it it solves so many mm-hmm. so many problems of getting your team kind of moving in the same direction. And I would assume from your experience too, and from I think from my experience, I resonate a lot with kind of how you approached even the book. If you're thinking things about how you do your job and how you wish other people did their job, you should probably write those down. Like you should right. probably just get yeah. them on the paper because then you can you can format those in a way that will then be an expectation or a value down the line. But if you just hold it all in as like, well, this is just the way that Todd works, the way that Luke works, right. and you never share it with people, they're they're not going to catch on. They're, they're not going to get that caught aspect of leadership. Yeah, and I think too, if you don't write them down, you, you're doing yourself the disservice of not really formulating what you really think about something. You could just yeah. have it in there and automatically do you know, I high pass filter this and I do, you know, like all the things that you're doing, you don't have to think about how you're doing it. You just, that's how you do it. And to, if you have to write them down, now you're like, okay, why do I do, you know, you just, it forces you to get in touch with, uh, you know, what is, what is the reason? And I would say, even for me, this writing this book, it was really, a, uh, so much of it was just me reflecting on what is important to me and let's write it down. And okay, now if it can help somebody else, then then that's great. Yep, I was yeah. I was even thinking about that, um, and I, I was reflecting on why. One of the things I hear all the time is that it's really difficult with tech people because what churches have most often, if they're kind of a small to mid sized churches, they have a worship leader who's got 
you know, maybe a, a great heart who really wants to serve the church and lead the church in, in worship. And then they've got a key technical volunteer who has, um, you know, maybe one or two things. They've either got background in IT and they, you know, so they're the guy, right? They're the guy the church says, oh, you do like networking. So you must, you must be qualified to be our tech right. guy. <laughs> yeah. Or they've run music or they've run venues for like productions, you know, for, um, right. for recitals or for large concert venues. They've ran front of house for some other rock you know, touring band or something like that. Right. And one of the things I, I think we come up against is the why in ministry with those people. Because if you talk to a guy who ran front of house audio for a rock band at a you know local concert venue, he's not going to mix the same way that your guy mixing for uh, Matt Redman or Tomlin is going to, right? They're right, different right. mixing philosophies. Um, so having the why of like, okay, here's, we understand the fundamentals, but there is this application piece that you have to understand the why of what we do in ministry is different than outside of the church walls, right? Right, yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, you bring up a good point. Uh, Even, like, what does it sound like is one Mm -hmm. of those things, what should it sound like? What do we want it to sound like? Because I think, you know, you have multiple volunteers that are trading spots on that front of house mix position. And, you know, it's really easy to say, well, you know, mix is subjective. And, yeah, but at a certain point, uh, what does the church want to be? what's the church about? And so what the part of that is, what does it sound like? Yep. And so sitting down with the worship leader and saying, let's listen to music together and figure out who do we want to, do we want to sound like Bethel? Or we sound like passion, do we, we, you know, just like, let's collect all the information so that when the rock and roll guy shows up and the IT person, we could say, this is what we need it to sound like. And obviously there's personality involved yep. and, and so it is going to sound a little bit different, but this is the goal. Um, I mean, it's just like the vision and values. Like, what are we shooting for? Yeah. And I think oftentimes, especially in production, nobody nobody talks about it. And so, right. like, well, we don't know what it should sound like or what the light should be like or what our philosophy on camera shots is. Um, we're just all running so fast, we're just doing it and yeah. and not talking about what do we want it to be. Yep. And I can guarantee you, you know, you look on Instagram or whatever, any social media, you know, a church that's doing something really cool, they've sat down and figured out this is what we, how we want it to be and we're going to work hard at it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and you can tell the difference. Yeah, I, we were thinking about, as you were saying, that, I was thinking about the, we did a Bethel Tech tour with uh, Chad Vegas right. and he was talking about how that's something that their team, everybody on their production staff knows what they're trying to accomplish. Like what is the measure of a kind of a, a good execution of, of the weekend or a successful weekend service. Right. Um, so everybody yeah. kind of during their camera ops or their video switching or their lyric operation, they know what they're shooting for because there is this cohesive vision among, among their team. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a couple of conversations with folks over at Hillsong in Australia mm-hmm. and they're spread out all over that country Seriously. And they all say the same things. They all talk the same way, not in a bad way. They just they they have latched on to this is what we're about, and we're going to be unapologetic about it. And so we're not doing this, but we're doing that, and we're doing that this way. And yeah, just it's uh, it yeah to do something. Uh, I mean, I I like to think um, in terms of. Uh, sporting team, like so. I'm not a big sports person, but I've been on a couple of kind of winning teams. Like I was in a musical group in high school that we were we crushed it, nice. and it was hard work, hard hard work. And it just made me think: every, nobody wants to be on a losing team. Nobody wants to suck. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to be a part of something really special. The challenge is it takes work to be a part of something really special. So you got to do the two a day, you know, practices and the, you know, do your push ups when you don't want to. And, you know, all those sporting analogies. Same, the same applies in production and worship, in how to do services. Like it just takes a lot of discipline to, like, this is what we believe and we're sticking to it and, you know, doing it again and again and again until we have. Uh, yeah, we're doing something really cool. Um, but yeah, it takes a lot of work. 
Yeah. I would love to, in, in light of the, the hard work kind of discussion, one of the things you talk about in your book is the excellence versus perfectionism discussion. And as you can imagine, I think this was a pretty big kind of explosive discussion that happened a, a bit back, like a couple of years back. That was like, a well, we want, we want it to be excellent, but we want, we don't want it to be performance, you know, or we want it to be good, but we don't want to be perfectionistic about it uh, right, because right. we don't want to make an idol out of it. Um, yeah. And I love that you talk about it because it is really prevalent to what tech directors and, and technical artists are kind of that battle in their head all the time. So you, you kind of said that there was a tipping point that helped you see that differently. Could you shed some light on kind of <clears throat> how your mindset shifted about that conversation? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, I think the, man, excellence versus perfection is something that we'll probably always battle with. It's like, as Andy Stanley would say, it's attention to manage. Yeah, uh, It's never going to go away. And so part of the thing about excellence that I love is that it means I'm better today than I was yesterday, or I'm imp- continuously improving. And so my excellence is different than your excellence, is different than my excellence was 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's a part of who I am personally and how much I'm willing to work on it. And so perfectionism is an impossible thing to, to achieve because I've, I just for me, I'm wanting to learn and grow all the time. That comes with failure, which yeah. means something's not perfect. Say now, it louder I, for the people in the back. Wanting to yeah. learn and grow <laughs> comes with failure. That's, yeah, if, you, that's if you're the, not failing, you're not learning. And so part yeah. of it is, I think... Part of it is having a healthy relationship with failure is important um, because otherwise you do get trapped in this cycle of wanting it to be perfect, but you're not actually doing anything differently. Um, You're not taking any risks whatsoever. And I think, um, yeah, to me, I know I'm human and so I'm going to make mistakes. And I also know that deep down, I don't want to be the spotlight of any any um or in any way <laughs> i don't want to i don't want people to know i exist uh, when we're talking about a service i want it to be totally transparent and the minute a failure happens now there's some it's more opaque like people are they're stopping hearing the message and they're they're seeing the failure yeah but um yeah the reality is stuff happens now is stuff happening because i'm lazy and not learning from my mistakes, I have a real problem with that. Yeah. But uh, or am I learning from my mistakes and continually improving? And I think the the challenge for us, we have an internal struggle going on, but we also have the struggle that exists from people looking in on what we're doing and feeling like we're too demanding and too like we are going for perfection. Um, and I think that's really a, a hard thing to work through with your the people that you're that you're working with, uh, worship leaders or senior pastors, or and so a lot of that just comes from history and trust and understanding, which comes from a lot of me explaining um, why, and even to say, oh, so this is maybe a, a tangent, not worth going down, but the. <laughs> My time at Willow and even my time at Kensington Church in Michigan before that, I felt like I was cycling through the worship team, the worship leader, the music director. You know, I was, you know, I would build up a relationship and trust and all this stuff, and then that person would move on, and then mm-hmm. I get somebody new, and then I got to go through all that again with somebody new, <laughs> um, which is fine. You know, it's just part of life, but um, I think. Um, I sort of lost my train of thought that just, you know, the fact that that trust, like I know this doesn't work because I done it with the last two worship leaders and we saw it fail, but there's a part of it that like, okay, I'm in order to build trust. I'm going to let, you know, let you see what's going to happen, which is hard to do as a tech person. It's like, I don't want to walk into something, know it's going to fail. Um, but I also have to be willing, this is one of those things like we were talking about earlier, sharing the responsibility. Yeah. 
if you're telling me this is what you want to do, you're hearing me say, I don't think it's going to work. We're going to do it anyway. Uh, I'm giving that responsibility. You're, you're owning it if it doesn't go well, but I'm going to show up fully to, uh, to execute this. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get all passive aggressive on you. I'm just going to like, you're not going to sabotage the mission. Right. I'm going to dig into this as much as if it was my own idea. And if it goes well, I, I need to stand up and say, Hey, I was wrong. Yep. You were right. If it doesn't go right, uh, then I just need to keep my mouth shut. Yep. Uh, I don't need to say, Hey, I told you so. I just need to say, ah, I mean, we're building trust and like, that's part of the, part of the equation. And so, um, I think, I think the, the perception that we have as perfectionists is unfortunate, but it's also, it requires education and relationship from our, us to that person yeah. to, um, yeah, to kind of dispel the myths that, no, we're just trying to do our best. And our best means this is what planning center looks like before we show up on Sunday. And, yep. you know, this is how prepared the band is. And this is what we're going to, we're going to be ready with all the lighting cues that we can conceive of before the band shows up so that we're ready to then now make tweaks. Um, yeah. So yeah, perfection, impossible, but excellence, everybody can be excellent. Yeah. And one of the things that you said in the book, and I'm probably going to botch this quote, so I apologize to, <laughs> to represent you this way. But one of the things that you mentioned in the, in the book is that your, when the perfectionism piece or the perfectionist piece is an internal, it's something that you think about yourself. Like most people aren't thinking that about you. Um, mm. Like it's, it's something of a self-perception issue rather than a, how you're perceived by people. <clears throat> um, so it's kind of one of those, Un, it can be unhealthy, but it's mostly an internal struggle. It's it's not a pressure that anybody is really putting on you um, yeah. externally. It's most of the time it's coming from inside. I say that very generally, and again, I'm probably botching what you actually. No, no, said. yeah, it's people should go buy is, the book and read it for themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so true. I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to not make any mistakes, and you know, there's, uh, there are those mistakes that happen that everybody notices. Like my grandma can tell there's a mistake happening production wise. Then there are those things that only I notice. And I think that's where we get into some trouble, uh, when it comes, yeah, just comes to living life. Number one. And, uh, as a production person in the local church or even a worship artist or whatever, I, I think we can all get caught in this, but I think it, it then leads to some things about, I need to cover every base so that I don't fail, which means yeah. I'm spending probably too much money on gear. Uh, and I, one of my mentors, Marty O'Connor, who used to be the TD at Willow Creek back in the 80s, um, he used to have this thing called the K factor. So K was the name of his wife. And he would like be buying two micro, you know, looking at buying two microphones. And so he would like, hey, here's... Uh, I want you to see if you could tell the difference. Here's the thousand dollar mic, and here's the hundred dollar mic. And if she could tell the difference, then he would buy the hundred, the thousand dollar mic. Yeah. If she, if if she could not tell the difference, he would buy the hundred dollar mic. And so he was always sort of gauging this level of perfection based on what's the average person going to be able to tell. I think you know the striving for perf- the perfect drum sound. You could spend a lot of money. And you're the only one who could tell the difference. Yep. And so yep. it's it's always an interesting, yeah, that that internal struggle of what what is perfect, what is excellence, yeah. what's the difference. And um, you mentioned like it doesn't really have an end in sight too, because right. then if you really do let it take full hold of your mental state, it becomes this like how much redundancy do I need in in my life to achieve the perfect situation you know like if and if yeah. your tension and your angst just continues to rise so it really you really do have to reframe that that mental shift to to yeah. be in a okay lord like do i i've prepared i've done my part i've worked as hard as i can on putting together a product that is excellent now take it and do with it as you please yeah i mean i think uh, it took me a while to get to this place but i you know what? God created me as a technical artist to serve in the local church. That's part of his plan. 
So if that's part of the plan and I'm living a life that's I'm miserable because I'm working too many hours or I'm trying for perfection and it's not, I'm not succeeding. And so I'm just, you know, um, uh, grumpy all the time or whatever. Like, I don't think that's the way God and, you know, he didn't create that special spot for me as a tech artist to live that way. And so I think it takes a lot of discipline on our, you know, ourselves to, have that healthy relationship between excellence, perfection, what's the difference, yeah. failure. Um, I think, I mean, I uh, back way back, this, this is before I had kids. I think I was married. I think I was married. Uh, I was tearing down from a, a like a midweek service that we were having. We were meeting in some like rented facility. I'm tearing down and my I see my wife make a beeline for the senior pastor, like in the seats. And I thought, oh my gosh, this does not look good. So I turned around on stage and was wrapping the cable facing upstage just so I didn't have to see kind of what was about to happen. (laughs) Anyway, afterwards, we had a chat and she basically read the riot act to the senior pastor. You're working my husband too hard. He's here too many hours, you know, just like laid into him. And he just took it. Great, a great guy. And he he had his, just a short answer. You know what? Uh, no one's asking your husband to work this many hours. And if he needs to say no to things, he needs to be a man and say no. And uh, uh, on one hand, it was devastating uh, to hear him say that because now I couldn't blame anybody yep. for the long hours I was working uh, to my wife. Um, but that yeah, that's one of those examples of uh, a lot of what I learned that I wrote down in this book was from... He was one of those guys that just yeah. like, hey, unacceptable. And this is what it means to be an adult. And you need to, you know, no one's asking you to work seven days mm-hmm. a week. Um, and I think God wants us to be in it for the long haul. And that can't happen if you're, you know, if you fry yourself uh, yeah. because you're working too many hours. Even if, as a volunteer thinking about that, I mean, I, I used to work 40 hours a week and then just drive straight to the church office and work until midnight every night. I mean, I did it every day. I loved it, but it also catches up to you. Yeah. And there's a honeymoon phase in that, in that season where you're like excited about what you're doing. So you're trying to give more time to it and the potential that's there, but you keep, you keep burning that candle at both ends. And that's when you start to loathe people. That's when the passive aggressivity sneaks in. That's when unhealth in your marriage starts to creep in. I mean, all the things start to happen. Yeah. And I think it's, it comes from that whole idea, similar to the, the mission and values. Like, why are you doing this? And, you know, being in touch with the why behind it. And I think yeah. um, so often, I mean, I'm just speaking for tech people who – General, you know, a lot of us have the gift of helps and just want, don't want to let anybody down. You just yeah. keep doing and doing and so doing true. without catching, catching yourself on why am I doing this? What's the purpose? And am I now defeating the purpose because I'm so miserable? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I think it just, it's another symptom of not sitting down and thinking out why. Yeah. One of the, one of the last sections, I mean, I, I can't, I really want, I want people to have this book for a lot of reasons. There's so many nuggets of wisdom throughout the many chapters. This is a short read. It's a pretty, I want to say it's like 205 pages or something like that. It's very super simple, very short chapters, which I think you were really smart about because you know that Mm -hmm. tech people (laughs) want kind of quick pieces that they can run with. Um, No silver bullet, but just quick pieces of wisdom that they can take with them from meeting to meeting or from, you know, season to season. And so I want people to read the whole thing, but especially for those who are either just stepping into it or are young in their ministry career, uh, need to read the last section, which is all about leadership and kind of setting the why and the tenacity to lead. One of the biggest things you said, and I think it was just a short paragraph was, I think it was a sub paragraph that said, go home. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, right. Go, you need to go home and not be at the church all the time and have some good boundaries. Get a hobby, <laughs> yeah. like yeah, right, yeah, the simple stuff. Yeah, so true. I mean, I I watched. Uh, I had a friend uh, who was we were working together. He was working for me, and but he was single, and he would never go home. He was there mm-hmm. the whole time. And I remember saying to him once, "Dude, go home. Like no one's asking you to whatever it is you're doing. No one's asking for that." 
And he's like, ah, I'm just, I would just go home and watch TV. So why not just stay here and keep working? And I just said, well, but that, but you're choosing that. You're, that's yeah. your choice instead of this thing that you feel like is being foisted on you. And I, I think having hobby, having kids really does it to you. I mean, you, you basically It'll shift your perspective a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You're forced into, okay, if I don't go pick my kid up from soccer practice, he's not, he's just going to be stuck there. So I got to go, you know, <laughs> you just have very, the, the, the boundaries become pretty hard and fast. But I think even I have another friend who was single and he's like, you know, I read that uh, part and I went out and I got a dog. Uh, I thought, you know, I'm living alone and, you know, I need something in my life that gets me home. And so now it's like, I got to let the dogs out. So I got to go. Yep. Um, and I don't think anybody thinks less of people for like, I've got a class I've got to go to, or, you know, it's my night for poker with my buddies. So I'll yeah. see you later. And I think, I mean, this is maybe a bizarre example, but back in 2001, when the very first Lord of the Rings movie came out, oh. So good. So I'm a gigantic Tolkien fan, and I was like, my living my entire life up to 2001, waiting for this moment. You know, <laughs> when the books become the movie. Now, in hindsight, I'm disappointed, but that's another story. That's a different podcast, I guess. But the the premiere was during Christmas, the Christmas run, you know, the run up to Christmas. So during rehearsals and all this mm. stuff, and we were in the habit of, you know our rehearsal schedule said we'd be done at 10.30 p.m., yeah. which usually means 12.30 a.m. Right. <laughs> and so I knew that I was going to go to the midnight showing opening night of this movie, and I did not care where we were, what was going on. And so I told... I was probably... This is one of my big passive-aggressive moments, <laughs> but I just said, I don't care what we're doing. You know, at um, at eleven thirty, I'm walking out and I'm yep. driving to the movie theater. End of story. If you want to come with me, great. But we will be done. You know, if we can't get it done by eleven thirty, we got other problems. You know, That's so sleeping time. Yeah. So I I walked out and a group came with me, and Christmas happened, and we had a great memory now of this movie experience yep. and then the next the following years for the next two movies we did the same thing and i think by the last year the 2003 we probably i think we rented the movie theater out like we took nice. so many people that you know it was just like a giant uh like all right stop rehearsal let's go yep. um but it just uh yeah one of those things like it didn't affect the bottom line hmm. you know leaving at 11 30 and nobody was upset they were probably really glad that somebody was, you know, was smart enough to say, "Let's be done by 11:30." So, I mean, you think about all those volunteers, like go home, yeah, like they got to get up and go to work the next day. And as the um, leader, you've got to take that initiative because they're all looking at you, waiting for you yeah. to be the one to say, "Okay, we're we're good. Let's like, you know, take a break, go home, come back yeah. to this either the next day or you as the paid staff person will kind of take care of the the remaining logistics. It's like, yeah. take a brief. I think about that too, when you're doing kind of overhauls in the day, um, maybe you're redesigning a stage or something. And it's like, it might be helpful to take a break to eat, you know, so that yeah. people can yeah, yeah. Take, step back and say, <laughs> okay, let me just like give my brain a break, give my hands a break and like yeah. refresh why we're here and what really needs to be done in what order. And so often we can just put our head down and get lost in the, we get swept up in, oh, we wanted to update our pro presenter, but now we want to redo all of our looks. And then we want to redo all, like you get swept up <laughs> yeah. into the next thing. And yeah. sometimes yeah, yeah. You just, you got to take a break and go watch Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And I think oh, that's like a quote right there. <laughs> um, the um, I think too, it's the, so maybe going back a little bit to the excellence versus perfectionism. This is a classic example of it's good enough. Yeah. And that is the hardest thing I think for, I mean, I, speaking as a tech person, I don't even like saying it out loud. <laughs> but I think there are so many times where we were reluctant to say that because it feels like we're lowering our standards or um, we know we can do better. And so it just rubs us the wrong way. But I think so often uh, something can be solved by saying, this is good enough. Um, and I, in a, I think is it Seth Godin, that says you just got to get it out there, like mm. just finish and put it out there. Um, 
Because I think, I mean, you know uh, how we can be like, oh, but it, if I spend a, another hour, it, you know, that, you know, the way this mix is coming together for this recording we're doing will be perfect or the color grading on this video, just a few more minutes. And I think there comes a time where we just have to say, it's good enough. Let's go watch Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yep. it's, um, and I, I think we, uh, um, it's easy to look at things short-sightedly. So to say, like, just because I'm saying it's good enough right now doesn't mean that I can keep working on it next week right. and make it a little bit better and a little bit better, which is really how you define excellence. Yeah. Um, not that it's perfect, you know, from day one. Um, yeah, so good I'll enough. Well, I'd love to, I loved, I did post kind of that we were going to be having this conversation on the church front uh, Facebook group and the worship ministry school Facebook group. So if a little plug, if you're not part of the church front Facebook group, go look at it. It's a free group. You can join it. Um, We ask you some questions about kind of what role you serve in, in your church, but um, that's welcome. And it's a great community there. So I posted that we were going to be having this conversation about this book. I said, any questions you would have for Todd Elliott, you know, he has been at Willow. He started the Philo community. What do you want to ask him? And so I have two that I'd love to, to hone in on. Um, okay. maybe you can give some insight off, you know, off the cuff to our listeners here. Sure. Um, the first one is a question I think a lot of churches are wrestling with right now. And they're saying, um, how do you get your, how do you cast vision to your upper leadership? And we've, we've put out a couple episodes around this conversation, but I would imagine that this, this question came from the perspective of you're you're trying to acquire a kind of, um, um, say you want to execute in a specific way. So you want to get a specific result in your ministry, um, but you don't have the gear or you don't have the, the manpower uh, to do so. And it's going to require some of those things to accomplish those goals. But your senior pastor or your worship pastor is not bought in. Um, you can't get them on board. So how, Todd, in your experience, how have you handled those conversations? How would you encourage this person in that season to handle that, that piece? Yeah, I think the um, the first thing I thought of was we need to learn how to speak the language that our senior pastor understands or whoever it is we're trying to convince of anything. What matters to them? What's important to them? And how does what I'm about to say influence that or take away from that or um, add to that? And so I think, uh, you know, if you're wanting to get a new camera for your stream, it needs to be you need to talk about it in terms of, okay, it's maybe it's going to help your workflow. That's great. But it's also a better picture, a better experience for our congregation. You know, the, the things that, um, yeah, how does what you're asking for affect what your church is all about? Yeah. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the stuff you're doing, that's what you're doing it for. And so how does it affect that? Um, and so I, I would say it needs to be just in terms that, that your leaders can understand. Um, the uh, just thinking back on some of my some of those moments for me that uh, it's when I I remember when I bought my I upgraded our soundboard. It was like the very first big thing I did. So we went from twenty four channels I was talking about earlier to thirty two. Yes. Woo! Woo-hoo. And I can remember <laughs> the I think the elders were asking, or maybe the senior pastor, will I be able to tell the difference? you know, spending all this money, will I be able to tell the difference? And I'm like, I hadn't thought about how to explain it um, because really it just means we can plug more things in. Mm -hmm. And so it will sound better. Will it make the service better? Yes. Will people be able to tell? I don't know. Um, And so I I dropped the ball big time on that because, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just didn't think about what is, uh, why I'm, I know why I'm asking for it, but why does it matter in the scope of what our church is about? Um, and I think too, another, another thing to think of is if you're, if you're having an idea yourself and you're, you're, you know, so, uh, that you're trying to sell to your senior leaders, even if you could, uh, couch it in terms of saying, could we try this for one week or two weeks, rent something like a low cost kind of low risk, and if it stinks, then we won't do it. But if you can tell the difference or like what you see, then you know that becomes a a selling point to to be able to um, 
to experience it instead of it just being you talking about it. Um, yeah, to say, uh, let's look at the difference between this, you know, our standard definition cameras. Let's rent uh, an HD camera for a week. Or I can get a demo for a week. And if you can tell the difference, then we'll keep talking. Um, yeah, just it's a great low risk. Uh, you're not asking for, you know, tons of money. You're just asking for, yeah. let's try something one weekend. I love that, man. That's that's such a creative out of the box. It feels so like duh, um, but yeah. you can rent equipment to try to achieve those results and see what the outcome is to show your leadership. I always think to be consistent and be prepared. Like have the logistics ready for your elders. Have the dollar amounts. Have the you know, and don't be a a, a gas person either. Don't be a gear acquisition syndrome, you know, <laughs> week, every week you want something new. Like if you've yeah. got a mission, vision and values, you know, piece to your ministry that you can validate some of these requests into, and you have prepared kind of, uh, you know, number sheets for them that walk out kind of the, the budget requirements and how it's going to achieve results. I think your team is going to support it's going to buy in pretty quick if you're professional about it and that yeah. i think you're i mean the rental piece is huge do yeah. that don't ever buy something that's six thousand dollars before you've rented it to make sure it works right right <laughs> and i think too it was something you said uh the that uh, the gear acquisition syndrome i love that i think uh the the single one of the single most important component to leading up uh, and trying to convince your leaders of something that's important to you is that you're trustworthy with what you already have in front of you. Yep. Um, I think if you're if you're missing cues or you know it doesn't sound good or you know the stuff with the stuff you have, um, I don't think anybody's going to listen to you about the extra piece yeah. of gear or upgrading or whatever. And so. Uh, you know, that Bible verse that talks about, you know, the parable of the talents, he who is trustworthy with little uh, will receive more. Mm. And the person who is uh, untrustworthy with little will have it taken away from him and it will be given to the person who's trustworthy. Yeah, I just, yeah. that parable just blows my mind. And I think it, it applies in this situation that um, building trust is the key and uh, the way to build trust is to, to crush it with what you have. Yeah. Yeah. Already. I love yeah. that. What about the the second question that was posted that I, I think is a really great question we can touch on real briefly is the the question was, how do you get non technical people into the into the technical arts or into your kind of production team? And I, I think I know where this person is coming from in, in a small to mid sized church, you're trying to launch live streaming. You're trying to have a good broadcast mix. You're trying to have good lighting and lyric cues executed on time, but you cannot find people who have that experience or that know-how to do it well. And so you're reaching out to people who have no experience or who have very little experience in the technical arts. How do you get those people integrated and, and used uh, using their gifts in the ministry? Yeah, that's a tough one because I'm definitely one of those people that feels like people are created for to fill a particular spot in the body of Christ and, uh, you know, to just jam people in because we need them. Yeah. I think for in the short term, yeah, totally uh, is, is a valid thing. I would say maybe a couple of things come to mind. One is find somebody that's, that's willing and available to do whatever. And I think that that applies even for somebody that says they're a tech person and wants to be involved. Like, if if they just want to run front of house, you know that I'm not sure I'm looking for that person. Right. I'm looking for somebody willing to wrap cables at the end of Sunday and yep. you know help sweep the stage or whatever needs to be done. And so I think even if it's a non tech person, find somebody that's willing to do whatever needs to be done. The other thing too is to create an opportunity for that person to succeed. So not giving them something that's so huge that they, they're they not going to uh, succeed at it, uh, but something that's bite-sized enough that you know they, they can do great work. Um, and I would say <clears throat> this is a little bit like the whole, like, let's try it for a couple weeks and see how it goes. 
to not uh, try to lock somebody into, we need you to serve until the end of the year, uh, right. but to say, hey, will you come and sit with me and let's try this? Um, you know, I th- and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I think, um, yeah, giving people small bite-sized chunks to, to, um, to commit to, uh, I think is, is one thing I would try. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, thanks for giving some answers there to the, to the Facebook community. I know they'll appreciate that. Um, my last couple questions are just fun, super kind of, uh, easy stuff as a podcaster. I want to know, you know, are you listening to anything that you're really passionate about right now in terms of podcast world or music world? Anything that you're kind mm-hmm. of consuming that is just lighting you up right now? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, maybe the wrong person to talk to about music. I tend to listen to a lot of classical music, uh, so there's not uh, there's not uh, you know a big artist that's blowing up on Spotify at the moment uh, in that world. Uh, but I will uh, do a quick plug. Uh, my son, my youngest son. Uh, is an artist, and I I got my like um, most listened to songs from Spotify, yeah. and his was the number one on my list, which probably makes sense because I'm a dad. <clears throat> but uh, just I've been super proud of him, especially in this year. Uh, he had 1.7 million streams on Spotify. That's crazy um, sweet. Yeah, so he yeah he he blew up on TikTok almost a year ago. And it's just been fun to watch kind of how wow. that has, uh, yeah, 40 million followers. And Did you ever think that that anyway. phrase would come out of your mouth? He blew up on TikTok. My no. son blew up on TikTok. I barely even know what it means. Like yeah. 2004, <laughs> Todd. Do, do you even know what that yeah, means no. as you're saying that? <laughs> no, my two-year-old son uh, at the time. Yeah, I don't know what I would have imagined. But yeah, I mean, even a year ago, I couldn't have imagined it. I mean, we were, he and I were on a road trip in January, like the first week in January last year. And it was all happening while we were on this yeah. road trip. And um, we were going places and people were recognizing him where, you know, at the Taco Bell where that we nuts. stopped. And I'm like, what is going on and why? Uh, I just didn't understand it. But he's really, uh, yeah, worked hard to kind of leverage that moment. And what's his name? Uh, Can people find him on uh, Spotify? Yeah, on uh, Spotify, it's uh, Carson Elliott. Carson Elliott. We'll link so to it his, in the show notes. So people can check him out. Yeah. So his big uh, claim, he's a, he's a keyboardist and he's, uh, uh, his claim to fame is a talk box moment that he d- did a recreation of, uh, somebody's song, you know, did a cover Yeah. and it just, yeah, just went crazy. I so, um, yeah, it's been fun. Okay. So I guess that's what I'm listening to the most, uh, yeah. just pr- proud dad moment. Um, as far as podcasts go, I've been listening to, um, I, I, I'm a huge fan of European football, so soccer. So I listen to a lot of podcasts about that, which I'm sure nobody cares. Um, uh, That's fine. Uh, but the the most interesting podcast I listen to, um, I'm still listening to it. It's called uh, Wicked Game American Election. Hmm. Let me just verify that that's actually what it's called. Uh, American Elections Wicked Game. So it's uh, like 60 episodes, and each episode is about an election that happened in the United States, presidential election. Wow. So it goes back to 17, uh, whatever, 88, yeah. I think, and just hits every election. Um, Way and cool. what the what the what the controversy at the time was, and... You know how crazy the election went, and um, yeah, it's been fascinating. I mean, I think, especially in you know this election we just had, so bonkers and weird. It is. It really does not compare to bonkers and weird that's happened already. Um, yeah. You know the the basically, I think the one election was decided by a Supreme Court justice. Hmm. Uh, one election went to a vote in the House of Representatives. Um, and can you, I mean, you can imagine if that happened today, we'd be Seriously. going like, oh my gosh, it's, it's crumbling around us. Yeah, it's happened a few times. So yeah. um, anyway. It like, uh, it like so. just brings your tension level down a little bit, goes, oh, we're this crazier things have happened. Right. Every four years, something pretty insane. I mean, one, uh, yeah, people who buy election, you know, who uh, the president is in someone's pocket and- Jeez. 
and you know you don't like hearing that but then you're like well four years later he got voted out and we're still here and it's yep. working fine and so yeah. anyway that's really cool so what yeah. about um any are you a television guy do you watch any shows that you're enjoying uh, i'm currently watching the west wing um uh the show from the early 2000s again um and it's gonna it's leaving Netflix soon, so I'm just trying to jam it all in. Oh, uh, I'm so glad I, I just finished it for the first time and I okay. it's now, you know, top three shows I think I've ever watched. I mean, it's just an incredible, incredible show. Yeah, the writing is amazing, the acting is amazing. Um I think it it I mean it's definitely leanings one way versus sure. the other, but it's so interesting just to watch I mean, I'm I, every episode i'm thinking who wants to be president i mean this this is like an awful job did you watch Uh, their special did you watch the hbo special no i'm going to when i get to the end but uh you will love it 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 is oh yeah incredible it's incredible yeah Yeah, i forgot how much i love this show and my wife i had to talk her into like okay let's watch this again she's like i don't know and now we're just like yeah, pounding our way through it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Um, anything else? Uh, I watched a documentary on the Electoral College that nice. was fascinating. Um, you could tell I'm kind of a nerd, I guess, in that respect. Um, any other shows? Well, my question is: as a football Amer- European football <clears throat> oh, yeah. junkie, are you watching Ted Lasso? Ted Lasso, best show on television. <laughs> uh, and I'm not saying that only uh, as a as a football fan, European football. But I've so I was very surprised. Have you seen it? I am about halfway through it right now, and I already am like I'm all in. This needs to be everywhere. It's amazing. Yeah, it is such a good show. I mean, I I think when I when you read the premise, you're like, this is like got 15 minutes in it, and it's over. Like yeah. I just how can they stretch this out over what six episodes or something? But yeah. <clears throat> I. I I think the show is brilliant. As a soccer uh, watcher, they've nailed it. I mean, they've done such a great job the of culture, being true to the sport, the, yep. the culture, the the up, you know, the the front office people, yeah. like how the fans are, all the pub culture. Yeah, yep. I've, they've done such a great job. Um, yeah, I wonder so. if it, I wonder if people who aren't dads are enjoying it as much as I'm enjoying it because I feel like the main character is is. He's saying all the things that I want to say, yeah. right? There are so many moments where I'm laughing. I fell asleep the other night laughing hysterically at just his character and things that he was saying that were like circling in my head. And yeah. I, I'm i like, man, other people can't think this is this funny, but I think they do. I think it's really, the writing is really good. Yeah. I mean, I don't know who the writers are, but they've done a great job. And I think it's been... I think a third season, like they've already approved two more seasons. Nice, so nice. Well, I'll have to for... re up my my <laughs> Apple subscription. <laughs> That's right. Crap. Not uh, we got to make the disclaimer. Not for small ears, right? There's uh, okay. there's a little bit of maybe not, language yeah. in there <laughs> and maybe some content, but it is really if you're if you're comfortable with some of that stuff as an adult, you definitely we we highly recommend it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So th- I guess that sort of leads to the other stuff that I watch on TV, which is I plan my Saturday morning around what games are on. Yes. So I have two teams I follow, Manchester City. Yep. Uh, mostly because everybody's a Manchester United fan. And I thought, well, who's the opposite of that? Uh, oh, Manchester has another team. I guess I'll follow them. Maybe I, yeah, maybe I'd pick a different Todd. team. You're a hipster. I don't know. I don't. I think I would have picked a different team if I'd known kind of all the history behind it. But, and then uh, in Germany, uh, I follow Dortmund, who's yep. uh, usually always coming in second. Um, but they got an American on their team, so got to root for him. Love it. Uh, anyway, so love it, man. Todd Elliott, Philo creator <laughs> and soccer slash football aficionado. Right. I thought about wearing my Eva Dortmund track jacket and I was going to wear it today, but they're not playing today. So I love it. I love it. Well, Todd, I mean, tell people where's the best place. I mean, I know everybody can find this thing on Amazon, but where's the best place for them to find your book? Yeah. So on Amazon, you're right. And then uh, also on Audible. So we have an audio version, which I read, which was excruciating to do, but (laughs) 
I I like listening to a book that uh, the author reads, so I went yep. through it. Uh, it was uh, I guess it was fun in a way. Uh, and then if you're interested in getting a bunch of books for your team, so one of the things about the book is every chapter has a couple questions at the end of it, so that you can have a discussion with your people um, and get on get all on the same page. Which yep. you know something we've been talking about. A great way to do that is just read through this together, whether you agree with it all or not. Just to do something together. And talk about it is so important. Uh, so if you want uh, 10 or more books, you can go to our website, which is fowler.org. I'm going to say slash book is probably yeah. the website. Um, we'll get you a place where you can buy 10 or more for a reduced rate yeah. price. So, yep. um, and uh, yeah, those are the places. And you can, yeah, fowler.org is our website. At Philo Community is where we are on Instagram and Facebook. We're on Twitter, which... Is anybody still on Twitter? I think probably so. Philo Ex-presidents. Conference. Yeah, well, Philo that's who's Conference. on Twitter yeah. still. <laughs> yeah. um, at Philo Conference is where we are there. So, yeah, those are all the places to see what we got going on. I love it. Go, if you are a worship pastor or if you are a tech director who's on staff, go, if you don't have the budget for it, you go ask your senior pastor or your elders if you can buy 10 of these for your volunteers. And I promise you, they will not say no. This is one of the best investments you can make Hmm. in your team is team building community and and vision that you guys can work through the discussion questions together and do this. If you're a volunteer, do the same thing. Go to the website, get a get a quote and, and get the ten, you know, box and and give it to your team. Like get your pastor to to buy uh, a box of these things for for your team because you will see working through the discussion questions, I think you'll see unity start to happen as you have these conversations in your context, in your church. And again, we just, we're big fans of Philo. I've been a long time Philo listener and subscriber and love the the progression of how many resources and conversations you've had with such great people in, in the technical arts, but now to be resourcing churches with, I think, a resource that has been long needed and has not existed and is coming from a really trusted source and a really... Um, um, yeah, a humble place just to share, uh, not necessarily to promote the name of Todd Elliott, but to just share what you've learned over the years and things that you hope to pass on to the next generation who's maybe just starting out, especially in this live stream, you know, most uh, transformed production season ever for churches. Right, right. Super needed. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, well, thanks, so Todd, good. for hopping on, yeah. the, on the show and uh, always great to catch up and we hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me on.